she will become the voice of hope. In the midst of a devastating war, they will fight for the future. Final Fantasy XII. Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, I played another Final Fantasy game for the first time, but we're going to put a little asterisk next to that because there is quite the story behind it. And get comfortable because I have a feeling with, based off the notes I took throughout playing Final Fantasy XII for the first time, I'm going to have a lot to say. So first, the story. How I was introduced to Final Fantasy XII I think is paramount to our discussion. I was a little kid looking for a game to play. I was getting burned constantly by movie tie-in games and I kept purchasing big brand new games and coming home very disappointed. So my dad had the novel concept, well let's look up video game reviews, I had never done this before. So we found IGN and we were looking at a ton of games and this is where I found the likes of Ninja Gaiden Black, Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy, God of War, but also the 9 out of 10 Final Fantasy XII. And that was a game I was really excited to pick up. So alongside all of those, I pick up Final Fantasy XII and I play it. I think I was just too young for it. It was big, broad, overwhelming, confusing, and I didn't finish it. So I moved on and played Jedi Knight Jedi Academy, something that was probably better for someone of my age when I was about eight, nine years old at the time. And I did enjoy that quite a bit. Now, fast forward to 2017, Square Enix re-releases Final Fantasy XII with the Zodiac Age, which comes with a bunch of brand new bells and whistles that we'll talk about in this video. And I was excited to do right by my childhood. Certainly, I'm old enough now to understand this game, comprehend it, complete it. And I did just that, crafting a review over on my Mr. Matty Plays channel, where I crowned it the worst Final Fantasy game I have played. It is also my most disliked video ever on that channel. To me, I take a lot of feedback into account, probably more heavily than other content creators. I take what you say seriously, for better or for worse. And when I get that much feedback that you are wrong, I feel like sometimes, even though I'm very strong in my opinions and I think they're well-researched, you have to take a look in the mirror. So after playing Final Fantasy X for the first time, I saw a lot of you wanted me to go Final Fantasy XII and play that again. And to me, after I completed this experience, it was really like the first time all over again, and I mean that in a very positive way because I was rediscovering things, reappreciating things, realizing things that I never even gave a second thought to in my first, or second if you will, run through of the game. And really this was my first playthrough of the game because I've come out on the other end, and I just want to say it right here early on before we get into the story, the gameplay, the themes, the music. I really like Final Fantasy XII now. And I kind of can't believe it, because if you have tracked me throughout all these years, I have slandered the life out of this game, calling it really bad, really disappointing, not getting why people like it, an auto fighter. But I opened my mind, I sat down, I tried to take the game for what it is, not what I want it to be, played it to completion, did a ton of side content, and now I am ready to talk about this game. So as always with these first time playthroughs, I expect that many of you watching this have played this game. I'm going to spoil the entire story from top to bottom, dissecting it alongside all of you, and then we'll get into the gameplay. But before all of that retro rebound tradition, I want to do a multi-complete box copy opening here, where we have the original Final Fantasy XII, Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age, and the sequel, Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wing. So we have a lot to open here, a lot to reflect on. If you're new here, you're into nostalgia content, retrospectives, reviews like these, consider subscribing. Let's start off with the OG. This is what came out in 2006, Final Fantasy XII. And I gotta say, just off the rip, I have always loved the art for this game. This cover art is beautiful with Vaughn, Ash, Fran, Balthier. You have Pinello, Bosch here. You got all the ships in the background. Just beautiful art in this game. Even when you're at the PlayStation home menu, hovering over the icon, beautiful. 
Discover the secret that will unravel an empire. As war looms on the horizon, the mighty Arcadian Empire begins a campaign to subjugate its neighbors. The small kingdom of Dalmasca was one such neighbor, and it is here that our tale begins. In a fight for freedom, fallen royalty and unlikely allies must struggle to liberate their homeland, trace the mysteries behind the empire's invasion, and unmask the players in a drama of justice and betrayal. And you see the judges here at the bottom. You see some gameplay screenshots here. Oh man, just already, uh, this is a spiritual type of playthrough because another quick story, when I fired up my PS4 save file, I couldn't believe it, but I was starting my playthrough the same day I started my playthrough in 2017. And today, as I record this, July 15th, I finished it the same exact day I finished my Final Fantasy 12 playthrough all those years ago. So it's crazy to think. But anyway, here's the disc on the right. Again, beautiful art. We have the manual here on the left. And as always with Square Enix manuals, it's a great one. It's a thick one. You have here a little bit of a prologue, kind of repeating what you read on the back of the box, but you can appreciate more of the art on the left. Um, they talk a bit about how it's an age when magic was commonplace and airships plied the sky. So uh, I'll talk about this a little bit when we get started, but this is definitely Star Wars vibes. Uh, a little bit of character bios here for everyone without revealing who they truly are. A lot of Humes in this party with Fran being the only Vera and her age unknown. This game was huge for its time. Of course, we'll talk about the scope and scale of it. So a lot of time dedicated to traversing the world, all the menus you're going to see, the equipment that you're going to throw on. All this is pretty brief until you get the licenses where they dedicate two pages to it because this is all of the character building. And my oh my, is that a deep system and even more pages here. They talk about myths, which are kind of your summons and your special attacks. The gambit system gets a couple of pages, which is understandable. It's very unique to Final Fantasy 12, so it's a really important part of the game the battle breakdown it's very different compared to past final fantasy games in my opinion and then some tips using libra selling your loot which is also functioning quite differently compared to other final fantasy games and so on and so forth plus the marketing slip here on the back that you could send into square enix if you so desire so that was about a ten dollar complete box copy i bought this when i was in boston for pax east and that's when i planned to do my playthrough and i just got to it now uh zodiac age this is the version that i played here it says return to the world of ivalice fully remastered in high definition for the first time featuring all new and enhanced gameplay features the new zodiac job system with improved battle mechanics fully remastered visuals and music including true 7.1 surround system Town, and endless adventures including hunts battles and mini games it's interesting because they don't really mention what i think is probably one of the defining features of the game which is the turbo mode uh inside you have reversible cover art that you can kind of see here you also have the stormblood pamphlet square enix was popping off at this stretch here they're promoting stormblood they're promoting rest in peace final fantasy 15 season pass Dragon Quest Heroes 2, you have Kingdom Hearts promos in here for 2.8 as well as 1.5 and 2.5 Remix, you have Final Fantasy Brave Exvius and Mobius Final Fantasy, and then Tokyo RPG Factory releasing a game in 2018, so they were promoting a lot, otherwise it's just the uh, photo sensitivity warnings in here, and that's all you'd get in a modern copy. I would recommend if you're going to play the game, play this version, I'll explain why. And then this one we're going to save for probably a separate video, but yes, this is a sequel based off Final Fantasy 12, and it takes place one year after the events of the main game. And there's a pretty significant teaser to this game that's planted right at the tail end of Final Fantasy 10, uh, 12. So with that, that's our complete box experience. I know it was a longer one, which is why I'm going to have chapters in this video. But now let's talk about the story in depth for Final Fantasy 12. Uh, first, I just need to address as a diehard Star Wars fan, the Star Wars vibes here. Now, there are a lot of parallels, and I do think the game manages to differentiate itself enough by the end of the game to not just be a retreading of Star Wars, but it's clear the inspirations are there thematically. You have the kid in the desert, aka Vaughn Rabinaster. He's saved by a sky pirate and his humanoid companion in a ship, kind of like Balthier is Han Solo, and Fran is, of course, Chewbacca. You have the Empire and their tracks specifically when they show up is very Star Wars reminiscent. They have a Consul or an Emperor. They have the Empire versus the Resistance. There's all different alien-like creatures. There's a Senate for God's sakes. There's airships which are kind of like the Starfighters that you see especially in the final cinematic for the game. It's like right there. It's, it's complete Star Wars vibes. And the judges are like the Royal Guard of the Empire. And 
a lot of people use this to sort of disrespect this game, but to me, Star Wars is what really ushered my love for Final Fantasy XII. I was really starting to dig this game a lot because I saw where the, the inspiration was coming from, and I thought this was very much a thematically driven adventure. So let's start off at the top. Uh, when I hated this game and I called it my personal worst Final Fantasy, I just want to say straight up that I always loved the intro to this game. I thought starting off as Rex in Nalbina Fortress, and you're kind of like quietly combing through the fortress with a little bit of a squad. I always liked that. I always thought it was a good, quiet start that really ramped up. And then the way they fast forwarded to Vaughn two years later, it felt just right. It felt like they really set the world up here and you got to see firsthand what exactly went wrong with this world. But also it plants a seed for a significant plot twist involving Bosch later on in the story. But this is 100% Ash's story. I just wanted to say that up front that that's how I received it. And I don't know if that's a common opinion or not. I don't like to research that type of stuff before I go into my re-reviews because I think it's important I give you as pure of an opinion as possible. But to me, I think Vaughn is kind of like an okay protagonist. And I feel like he's just there because we were in the era of like, you must have a male protagonist. And also I did read one thing online which said that based off the reception to Vagrant Story and it's older male protagonist, uh, they wanted someone younger. And so they went with Vaughn. And I don't know if that was really the smartest call, but he ties in the story in a, a better way than I had remembered. And I don't dislike him as much as I used to, but I still don't think he's really up there. Like I liked Titus more. I preferred him if we're going off recent Final Fantasy experiences. Vaughn's not a bad character though. I used to call him a bad character, but this is Ash's story. And so it's here in Nablina Fortress that we learn that the king was a traitor to Dalmasca and Bosch had killed him apparently. And Dalmasca is now the proper of the Empire. It's then told to everyone that not only is the Emperor dead, but Ash has now killed herself because of what happened here. And in the meanwhile, Vaughn is motivated to get back at the Empire for everything he took back from them. He sees Vayne. He's like, I don't like this guy. I don't like what the Empire has done to us. So he wants to infiltrate the Empire. So he breaks in and he steals the Goddess Magisite, which is what the Empire is looking for and is a spark plug to a battle between the Resistance and the Empire. And to me, this at first when I played it felt like the most unelegant start to the game. Like it felt as if Vaughn just tripped literally into the main story. And they even admit that inside the manual when they're talking about Vaughn's character bio that he wants to get back at him, but they kind of do it in a way where he didn't know just how deep he was really gonna go after he had committed to that. And so he does get swept up into this adventure. That's truly what happens, but I think as he starts to establish himself more, that's where he improves. Originally, I thought this part with Balthier, Fran, and Vaughn was a, kind of a wasted part, but I think the setup's there because then after gathering the party, you head to Bujerba. You want to head to Bujerba because this is a neutral state and Andor was the one who announced that the king was dead and that Ash had killed herself. So now they want to reach Andor since their goals are unified. And by the way, can I just highlight again a little bit of Star Wars vibes here? Andor? Endor? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking a little too deep into it, but come on now. So... You start to get Andor's attention a bit. So you, you do this hilarious mission where you run around and you have Vaughn going, I'm Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmasca. And uh, I kind of like this stuff. Uh, to me, that's what's a, a bit of the charm of the PS2 era. It's very gimmicky in a sense. Uh, it, it was tough to figure out at first, like, okay, I have to go to these very specific, I think they were like just the cars and say this to them and they'll start to spread the word. It, it made sense, but it was hard to convey that to the player. But anyway, once you get inside, you find out that the Marquis or AKA Andor is suspected of funding the resistance. And so he can't really act too strongly. And Vane is looking to puppet Ash to work through the resistance on his behalf. So what you're starting to see here come together is a very tangled web, a heavily political plot. And that's what I started to love about Final Fantasy 12. I was like, this is complex. This is mature. Sure, this is deep. Everyone's true ambitions and motivations are sort of masked here, but they're slowly becoming clearer as time goes on because this is also where you meet Lord Larsa. And at first you're like, oh, who's Lamont? Uh, but it turns out this is actually the younger brother of Vane, the person that Vaughn hated. Uh, so it's this awkward relationship here. And we know that Pinello gets very close to Larsa and sort of establishes this more motherly figure, if you will. 
So then this is also where you start to learn about Vane looking for a stone that was found in the treasury, AKA Nethesite. They also say now that we had Vane looking for this power, we need to establish the resistance. Andor cannot do this because they're trying to remain neutral while quietly funding the resistance. So Ash needs to go, prove her birthright, and she heads out to find the Dawn Shard. And so Balthier kidnaps her along with the rest of the team and they go out on a big grand adventure and this game eventually has this beginning again feeling i know this is maybe a hot take but one of my favorite things about final fantasy 12 is they didn't feel the need to do the big ship section where you do like the first half of the game and you go through the entire world and the world unlocks entirely and they're like now you can get in your airship and fly anywhere Technically, they have that right because you can get into airships at the Aero Domes and you can go ahead and go back to certain capitals that you were at previously. But it's not this big grand thing. They just kind of let the story guide you and keep going and, and pushing through. So I did like that they sort of skipped that aspect of the game when you were kidnapped because to me, that's what felt like the beginning again moment. Now, things do get simplified a little bit here. They effectively just say that the Nethesite that the Empire is tracking down is so that they can have the power of the gods. And they just want to be the next Dynast King, which is a, a big, big part of the story because that's Ash's bloodline and that's why she needed to get the Dawn Shard. Uh, but it's kind of interesting because then you see when the Dusk Shard is near her that Pinello was holding, that it does glow in a certain instance. And I like that because it was a little bit of foreshadowing that's like, yeah, it is her. But when you go to the Dawn Shard and you escape, and it turns out the Empire has now snagged you up. And this is where one of the first major plot twists happened that I loved, which is that Judge Gabranth is actually Bosch's brother, and their father is the Emperor of the Empire. And he's actually regretting his violent actions, his calls to war, because now it's caused a divide between their family. And low key, I just think like the, the family of the Emperor, Bosch, and Noah Gabranth is the the best part of the game like i really like that triangulation because they slowly grow in the background and i think they're a part of the most emotional aspect of the game so Vossler ends up betraying the group because he wants to restore the kingdom of Dalmasca and thinks that all of these efforts are pointless and tries to force everyone to give up the shard because he wants to preserve the Dalmascan Empire, whether it is good or bad, he just wants the kingdom to survive. So his intentions are there, and I guess good, but he completely loses the plot, it seems. So Vossler betrays you, and this isn't the first time we get something like this. We have judges who are sworn to protect Larsa, uh, they're loyal to Vane, they're splinters of rebellions, and there's twists and turns all over, right? So everyone's starting to show themselves, and it's right here where I get a little annoyed, because then... I feel the story really slows down because we're in an era of JRPGs needing to be bigger and broader when I don't think that was always their identity. Like you look back at something like Chrono Trigger and it's like that was a 20 hour game and it's one of the most famous JRPGs. Uh, whereas something like Final Fantasy 12, as we'll talk about when we finally get to the gameplay, is all about big and broad. Continuing on, this is where I feel the slow part truly begins, because you have to go to the Gareth, this little village, and try to learn more about the Magisite lore. And it turns out that the Magisite you have is dried up, and Ash can't really use it like the Dynast King. So, what happens now is Larsa suggests, okay, since we can't do that, we're going to snag the crown, so then she can declare peace as queen and prevent a war between between the two large nations. So it's like, okay, now we're gonna go to Mount Burr Omises. And you get told by a representative of Rosaria, this random dude with sunglasses, that things change and her actually revealing herself would cause more problems. And I'm like, okay, we're just going around doing errands now and, and no one's thinking anything through. Like if we could have just sat there and said, I am the queen, gave her the crown. Why did we do that? Why didn't we suggest that and do that in the first place? <laughs> If we didn't have to go and get the Dawn Shard to prove that, if we had that as an option, and then when we pursue that, we get some random dude in sunglasses telling us, he pops him down, he goes, that will actually cause things to become more problematic. I'm like, okay, what, what are we doing here now? Uh, and I think this is where this story begins to get more and more stretched out. However, it does start to ramp up a little bit in the cutscenes because this is a part where I think the size of the game and its gameplay spaces can betray it a little bit. However, the Emperor dies here, and there's a fear now of a Rosaria invasion because there is a power vacuum, and now 
Vayne is going to fill that up. And presumably, Vayne wants to take out Larsa as he may be the remaining threat. So there's a lot of tension here. And also, now Grand Kiltius gets involved and he mentions that there's another gift that exists, one that can destroy the actual Nethesite, the cause of his own power. And so you go to get the Sword of Kings in a very meh dungeon, a dungeon that again, much like a lot of this game, I think gameplay wise, is far too big for its own good. You finally get through it and you start to see the, the tangled web of Ash's past really causing hesitation in her actions. Uh, Ash is personally alongside Bosch, uh, my favorite character in this game. I think Ash uh, has so much lightning vibes, like the way her, her outfit is, just purely on that level. Everything else really isn't similar, but uh, she reminds me of lightning in her getup. And uh, I love how she's really struggling with her past and she's indecisive. Does she want the power of the stones? Does she want to do what the Dynast King did? Does she need to kill the empire? Does she need to seek peace? And she's a young queen, right? She's 19, it says in the manual. So she's really going through it, but she has a group of friends that are there supporting her, but letting her make her own choice. They respect her power, and I like that. So you find out that she was to be wed to a man named uh, Rassler. I believe his name is, or Vassler? One of those two, I apologize. But it turns out that this is actually a, a, a set of characters later in the game kind of planting the seeds uh, of doubt and hesitation and that this is a spirit of vengeance, if you will, not actually a, her husband's, her, her would-be husband's spirit. Uh, so again, this is where I think the, the pacing problems start to pick up a little bit. You go all the way to Salika Wood, you have this long run, you find the bungalow Koopos on a break. It's like, what are we doing here? Like, why does this have to be a thing? Then Jewel says, in order for you to get by into the Empire and actually reach the Dracolor Laboratory, uh, you need to get these keywords, and he does that twice, so it feels like the game, in some of these instances, is stopping me. And keep in mind, this is with Turbo Mode, where I'm not rushing the game. A lot of people in Final Fantasy X's video accuse me of rushing the game. Heaven forbid we use our, our Turbo Mode, which Square Enix provided, and they had not only double speed, but four times speed, because they knew how slow this game could be, and how big some of these environments are. So yes, I did use it, and I can only imagine in the original version, how much of you had to become one with your couch to actually go through this game because you'd probably have sessions where you just go through big dungeons and then finally hit that next story moment. So the way I'm looking at it is it has better pacing because of turbo mode, but even though there are still pacing issues, imagine if there wasn't turbo mode, you'd go ages without any type of cutscenes. And I think the story is one of the best parts of the game. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure I hammer here that this game does at times have pacing problems, particularly in the middle section where I feel like you're doing a lot of pointless busy work and the game's intentionally making things bigger and broader when I don't think it needed to. But as a PS2 game, I can't help but be impressed. So I'm sort of middle of the road. I'm ondoring this one. I'm neutral, if you will. So you get to the Dracula Laboratory and this is where I think again, Full steam ahead now. Now the game's not slowing down. Now we're really punching hard. So you find out Sid, Dr. Sid, is obsessed with the Nethesite. And Ash too seems interested in the Nethesite, the resistance as well. So everyone's like now gunning for this power because people are starting to get desperate given the state of the war. Things are starting to come to the head. And you start to hear about this mystical being Barach. And you're like, who, who, what is that? And you just see Sid talking to himself. Not sure really what's going on here. But he says, and he plants a seed to go to Garovagan, where there may be another stone. But why would he tell you about it? Well, it's because he wanted to drag you out there. So you go and follow the bait, and you go to Garovagan, and you find out this is the home of the Okuria. So these are these kind of godlike creatures. And it's here that I had a moment of hesitation where I was loving this story. I was like, oh, God, like, Please don't tell me we're going to go down this fighting the gods path. But this game threads the needle beautifully. I love how they handled it where it's almost just divine intervention in a way that's making sense. So it's here you learn about the sun Christ, the mother of all Nethesite. You learn that Banat is a heretic who left the Okuria and is swaying man, specifically Dr. Sid. So there it is that Ash is granted the Treaty Blade and the power of the Dynast King. And they call for her to destroy the Empire, destroy the Sun Christ, and all the stones could also become powerless 
or you could cut your own new stone and dominate. So this is where Ash is really starting to feel the pressure. So off you go to find the Sun Chris now nearing the finale of the story. And you enter what I call Tartarus in Final Fantasy XII. 100 floors? Excellent. I know it's not exactly 100 floors, but oh my god. This is a big dungeon. This is a ridiculously big dungeon with three ascents. And at one point, the dungeon handicaps you and says, pick between your steel, your magic, your items, your knowledge. And it doesn't matter. One of those is going. I picked items and the game screwed me over almost at one point where uh, everyone died from a trap that was on the floor. And uh, yeah, I couldn't revive anyone with items. Vaughn didn't have any healing spells. Both my white mages died, so I didn't have anyone to res. But fortunately, Rassler, who is a major character here, actually had a healing spell to res everyone so i was okay there but it's here at the top of the tower that you have what i think is one of the best moments of the game so it's again this triangulation where you have judge gabranth showing up and he's challenging ash's ideals of power and how sid blows the whole roof off the place now showing that these stones cannot go to waste as he will become a god himself and he's pretty much doing Varat's bidding here, but you don't really know that. So you have Gabranth telling you to take the power, you have Sid displaying that power, and then you have your own group who's like, we don't want to be like the Empire, but they're clearly a bunch of bad apples. What do we do here? So Sid, after a pretty cool boss fight, eventually dies, and he tells Balthier to spend his pity elsewhere, because it's in Draclor Laboratory, in, in Arcades, that you learn that our man Balthier was a part of the Empire. He was a judge. I love Balthier. This man is a goat. I, he is amazing. You, you want to talk about a character that is wonderfully written, beautiful dialogue. I just one thing I love about this game, the dialogue is so great. And uh, Balthier is one of the main reasons why. So now we're about to enter the finale where Aretas has sacrificed himself. He's destroyed the Sun Crist, and all that's left is to go take out the Empire. However, as the Sun Crist was there, it was letting out a lot of mist. And that mist had breathed life into the sky fortress known as Bahamut. Of course there's Bahamut. And now a war has begun between the Empire and the Resistance. So you go through a dungeon and it is a boss gauntlet at the end because things are coming to a head and Ash has declared that they're going to take down the Empire, but they're not going to destroy them and that we can find peace here between Larsa, Ash, and the Resistance. So what happens is you have Vayne again speaking to Vinat like Sid did. So this this Okuria is still haunting the Empire, guiding their decisions, making them lust for power to the point where their ultimate goal of achieving, bringing back the Undying, will soon be accomplished. And again, you see that in the boss gauntlet where you fight Judge Gabranth. You fight Vayne. You fight what I like to call Broly Vayne. I mean, look at this guy. He's jacked. He's got the same... Uh, wrist cuffs, he's got the same giant necklace, I mean, Broly, straight up, and then you fight the Undying, but to me, I think the hardest hitting part was Judge Gabrant's death, right, this is a guy that was just trying to get his honor back, he was just trying to get his honor back, and he was envious of his brother, who despite failing in multiple instances, he actually, he would still retain his honor, and Given that we now know at this point, well before this, that Gabranth had actually killed the Emperor himself. And he was doing all this to protect the Empire. And Gabranth can feel very aimless at times, but he's a great villain character. And I got to say, I appreciated him for that. So his final dying words are to protect Lord Larsa. And as the game concludes after the final boss fight, you see there and then that uh, they, they successfully used the voice changer to pretend to be Judge Gabrant, and it's instead Bosch. But then Larsa, Ash, everyone calls for a ceasefire. And as Bahamut's going down, Balthier and Fran are with that ship, and they are guiding it away from Rabinaster. And it's there you think the noble sacrifice has occurred, and both of them are gone. And then we get into, in its finale, its true finale, a wonderful ending cinematic. One that I just love. The song, seeing Larsa reading a letter from Pinello, recapping what's happened in the last year. 
Bosch serving Larsa in Noah's place. He even has his hair cut now. Ash is the queen, so everyone's hardly together. There had to be this necessary distance. Balthier and Fran stole back the straw, and they're actually alive. Ash gets her wedding ring back, which was payment from the beginning of the game until he found something more valuable, which is the cash of Labados, which now we have Vaughn as well as Pinello out to go find in this game here. So once the story wrapped up, I shed a tear, man. I was like, wow, that just everything feels like it came full circle between the characters with Balthier really becoming, a, you know, showing nobility, even though he's clearly a sly cat. Fran guiding the party and, and I think having some of the strongest character moments, especially in Celica Wood, where even though it was a slow part, I think she shined there. Vaughn really coming to his own and showing that he can let go of the past and let go of what happened to Rex in that very sad moment where you actually see Vaughn talking to Rex and Rex is like a shell of himself and then Rex died. Um, that moment really hit hard and uh, Vaughn letting go of that and pushing for a more healthy future I think was powerful in a weird way. Of course, Bosch really being a, a controversial character, if you will, in this universe. Uh, and what he has overcome was really empowering. I think Pinello was kind of the weakest character. Pinello just exists, is very dependent on Vaughn, it felt like, and she develops more of a motherly role. And she's a good black mage, I'll say that. I liked her as a black mage. But yeah, overall, when this story was done, I was really, 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 really pleased with things. So, I've spent a lot of time on the story, breaking all of it down from its characters to its defining moments and my response to them all. So now, we get into the gameplay. So yeah, I beat this game on New Game Plus. I know that's going to be to the dismay of many because I didn't struggle, kick and scream across a number of ridiculous boss fights. But trust me, I remember some of them from my first playthrough that really drove me up a wall. That is one part that did stick with me. So I was happy to leap into New Game Plus with Strong Mode and start off the game at level 90. And you know why I'm happy about that? Because number one, the end experience was I actually really like Final Fantasy XII now. But the other part about it is that I had the opportunity to focus on the mechanics and get a true grasp and understanding of things like the gambits, things like the license boards, and how to properly build my characters. Because while I understood back in 2017 when I first reviewed the game what they were trying to accomplish, I don't think I had a true grasp of how to utilize them. And I think because I wasn't worrying about my health, my items, my magicka, and trying to figure out the builds at the same time and utilize the gambit system because I only had to focus on one division of the game to really, by the way, give it a chance because this was the part of the game I hated. Uh, this was, I think, really important to this playthrough. So I was happy to, in the opening couple of hours, until things started to scale to my level, yeah, beat up on some bosses, rinse a lot of the opening areas. It did make the game a little bit of a shorter playthrough. But because of that, I was able to go out and do side content, which I'll talk about. But yeah, I did this on New Game Plus, and I had a absolute blast with that. I want to talk about Zodiac Age, though, as a remaster package because that's the version I did play as I said and as I showed on the back of the box they overhauled the visuals they overhauled the audio I did notice a lot of audio inconsistencies where some microphones sounded like they were back in 2006 like very scratchy very hollow uh, very unfiltered it sounded really strange because a lot of the rest of the audio is cleaned up so it was a very inconsistent scrub job here by Square Enix fortunately as I got deeper in the game it didn't become more of an issue. One other problem I do want to note that was not a problem back in 2017, and I think maybe due to PlayStation 5 back compat, is uh, this game crashed on me a good number of times or froze on me when I was trying to save my game. And I didn't blame the game for this because again, I know I wasn't experiencing crashing or I would have really, really even got in harder on this game if it was broken on top of my initial dislike of it. Uh, but I think this is PS5 back compat in some way because I've heard issues with other games where people are like, this was fine on PS4, but now on PS5, it's just crashing on me. And that's something that happened with Final Fantasy 12. But again, much like the audio scrubbing, as I got deeper in the game, that lessened. And by the final 20 hours of my experience, I was just like, well, uh, this is a non-existent problem now. Should I talk about it? Well, yes, I'm going to anyway. So 
Let's move on to another thing I noticed with the gameplay experience. Uh, no difficulty settings. I thought this was strange because there were moments I really wanted to bump up the difficulty and make things a little harder because, again, I started off the game at level 90, so pardon me for uh, beating up on some baddies, but I wanted to have a little bit more of a challenge because I could hear the retro rebound alarm going off in my head as the same people who complained about me using turbo mode of Final Fantasy XII would be the same people who complained that I used a new game plus save file. I was like, what if I could just ramp this up just so I could say, shut up, leave it be, I enjoyed the game anyway. Uh, but I couldn't do that. There was no options for that in both versions of the game. So I was like, you know what? It is what it is. And it got, again, the point across to me, which was understanding the gambits and the license system. But I also want to talk about some very important quality of life enhancements before we get into the meat and potatoes of the actual gameplay system. Thank God for the map overlay. Right next to the turbo mode, which I'll get into in a moment here, uh, the map overlay is a game saver. I feel bad for some of you who had to pause your game constantly to figure out where you were facing, which orient, which way you should go down these very samey looking corridors. Final Fantasy XII is a very impressive game in scale and scope, especially on the PlayStation 2. It is insane that they crammed this all into one disc, as you saw when I opened the complete inbox copy. Absolutely bonkers. However, a lot of these dungeons are way bigger than they need to be. And when you're pausing the game constantly, I could see this being frustrating. But with the Zodiac Age, it's one click of the left stick, and you got the map overlaid right there in front of you, and you can see what you've explored and what you haven't, and find your way through some dungeons. And when you combine that with Turbo Mode, a lot of the frustration that could be built into poor pacing is pretty much erased, because you can also choose the type of Turbo Mode that you want. Double speed, four times speed, or no speed. You could just go through the vanilla experience if you'd so desire. To me, it's much like Trails. It's much like Final Fantasy X. I'm like, you know what? Sometimes being able to quicken it up when I want to, like Final Fantasy X, I mostly played in its normal speed, but there were times I was really grabbed by the story. And I was like, let me turn on turbo mode. Like I want to get through these fights and see what happens next. Having that option for players who want to have it is not a bad thing. And I'm sorry if I'm lecturing some of you, but some people really had a problem with turbo mode in Final Fantasy X. It's in triangle strategy. Like turbo mode is a thing people like, and you're not rushing it because you choose to use this game mechanic. So please learn how to accept it. With that turbo mode in Final Fantasy 12 is a godsend because this combat and these areas are big. I'm talking like when you're heading to Mount Buromi Sace and you are going through area after area after area after area, that is one long trek. That is a stretch of the game that could take hours. And I like that because it feels like an adventure. But if I'm able to quicken that up a little bit and it, you get that good feeling, you know when you're in a grind for a JRPG, you're killing a lot of enemies, you're leveling up, you're getting, in this case, license points too, and you're really just sawing up area after area. It feels good when you can get that pace really going, quickening it up. So to me, I kind of liked this part of the game in some instances. It hurt the story, but for the gameplay experience, I feel like this is where turbo mode shined bright. I was like, perfect. This is a time. Click it on. Kick my feet up. Let's run through some battles. Get some license points. Get some levels going. Bring in some other party members. Get them some experience. Level them up. But let's talk about the core of the game that I think I really struggled with in my first run throughs of it which was the licenses and the gambits. I want to start with the licenses because that's what you build your character around. I mean, these licenses determine everything from stat bonuses to spells and abilities, as well as even simple things that came with the Final Fantasy experiences before it. Things like equipping armor, weapons, accessories. It is insane how much is tied to this system. And I think it does get to the point of ridiculousness where you're shopping for spells and occasionally looting them. And some of the most powerful ones are hidden in chests. And like, really? You know, usually this stuff is like tied to leveling up. And I think you could put some in the license boards. But instead, what they do is make everything tied to the license board, even down to the remedy. One of the best healing items for status effects in Final Fantasy can be rendered useless if you have not got remedy lore on a lot of the characters who could use them. And to me, that was a moment of like, whoa, this is this is intense. I just can't throw on this accessory here. I gotta <laughs> I gotta work my way to it. I mean, the game really emphasizes character building. And in the Zodiac Age, you don't get just one license board, but two. So for those who have not played it, 
you choose one of a multitude of classes and these classes are cool like a time battle mage you have someone who can use a gun the bushi the shikari the foe breaker the knight so on and so forth and i felt like here's where i started to really fall in love with the game i was like this is cool because now i can either create like a a, a class that really manages to be a jack of all trades like i made ash a monk and a red battle mage and so she was just doing everything meanwhile i made fran a monk and a white mage i found a lot of success and i don't know if this is a common thing but i found a lot of success with like monk and mage style classes kind of crossing them over uh, making them sort of like a, a beat stick that can also cast spells uh, that to me was awesome to be able to mix and match those things and you had characters like Vaughn who were sort of a jack of all trades you could take them in any direction you wanted now I made him a Bushi Shikari but I remember in my first playthrough I had success making him I want to say a Bushi white mage um, you could do I don't think that's ideal by the way but you could do a lot of things with these characters and I thought that is such a cool aspect of this game. So as you defeat enemies, you're going to gain these license points and you'll just spend them constantly, whether they're in the party or not, they're going to get license points. What's weird about that is they won't get XP. So if you want to get people's levels up, you have to have them in the party. Another thing I was happy to kind of be rid of in my new game plus save file, I was like, come on in Pinello, we can use you. And I got to use my party for a lot of instances. Now I will say with the second license board, it did shrink the opportunity for other party members to get in. Like, I like Balthier a lot, but he had like 3,000 license points by the end of the game. I didn't really use him that much because I was actually rocking with a completely different party than I usually did. I was getting Pinello involved. I was getting Fran involved. If I, when I loaded up my old save file, I saw all of those characters were at their base levels when they joined the party. It was really the party of Vaughn, Ash, and Bosch. That was my party. Didn't really touch anyone else. And again, that's a testament to just how little invested I was in Final Fantasy XII when it first came out. But here, I was happy everyone was scaled up because I was interchanging my party members when those opportunities presented themselves. Speaking of which, that is really where the Gambit system shines, and now I get it. So originally, I called this game the Auto Fighter. You know, you just run off and you beat up some enemies. But you know where my brain did these mental gymnastics that got me to accept this game for what it is? I was playing it, I was at my like 15th hour, I was enjoying it at the time, and I was like, you know, this combat is just like KOTOR. I'm lying to myself if I think this combat is nothing like it. You run up to enemies, the fights begin, you have a set of abilities you can pick from while fights begin. You know, I, I mean, you run up to an enemy, the fight begins, they start fighting for you while you're selecting abilities, you can pause the action, you can pick your targets. I was like, this is literally like my favorite game of all time. Why am I not liking this gameplay if it's literally the same? And yeah, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so that's a pretty big factor. And KOTOR has some of my favorite storytelling moments in all of gaming. But I also do defend its gameplay to some extent. I do say it's not as bad as people make it out to be. I don't think it's great, but it's not as bad as people make it out to be. So why can I defend that, but I can't accept Final Fantasy XII as the auto fighter? Well... I had to grow up a little bit. I had to open my mind a bit. It's kind of the same thing. In fact, I would argue Final Fantasy XII is much deeper. And that's because of the Gambit system. So you can go into this Gambit system and you can set up like how characters are going to fight in certain instances. If they're weak to fire, use a fire spell. If your party member is low enough at like 40% HP, cast Kira. If your party member is being swarmed by two plus enemies, cast Protectga. That type of stuff is actually awesome because then you can turn off the gambits for when you really need to get behind the steering wheel. Like you're fighting an Esper, you're fighting a boss. You're like, okay, I need to control things. We can't auto fight this one. And so that's where it turns into like this turn-based RPG that I always loved, where I'm just like really choosing what's gonna happen. And after you kind of put the pieces on the chessboard, watching how it all unfolds, it was rewarding. And it's another reason why, again, I love my new game plus save file because in some of those moments where I was in cruise control in the open world areas, it felt really good because I had set my gambits right. So everyone, when they got low, was getting healed. When they were getting swarmed, they were having the proper white mage spells cast on them. When they were facing enemies that were only weak to magic, someone was ready for that. And it felt good. It felt like I was prepared for every situation. Now, yes, there is the reality there that I could kind of overpower at certain stretches of the game things that were not supposed to be fought a specific way. But I tried to play by the rules. I tried to make sure I studied enemies, used Libra, read up on their weaknesses, and really got into the nitty gritty and didn't just try to steamroll this game as so many people had accused me at times with Final Fantasy X. But the Gambit system is great. 
It really is because there's nothing quite like it. I, I like the customization of the AI there and the ability to turn it off and really get behind the steering wheel uh, made it where some boss fights were really, really intense. So I was a fan of that. And that's why I actually found myself for the first time ever in Final Fantasy XII history for Maddie doing side content. Whoa, no way. Yeah, I was doing hunts. I did almost all of the hunts. I'm still doing them. I'm planning on completing all of them, but I'm trying to like gauge if I really want to do that. Cause if I go this deep, I'm like, if I fight, I think Yasma is the name of it. The, the million health boss. <laughs> If I do that, I might want to go all in and get the platinum. And I don't know if I'll have the time to commit to something like that with all these JRPGs I'm really excited for, like Live Alive and Digimon Survive and so on and so forth. Xenoblade Chronicles 3, I'm like, do I really want to go all in or should I pace myself and maybe I can come back to this later? To me, the hunts were awesome because this is where the challenge and fighting like espers out in the open world like Adremalock was great because I was really, again, controlling the flow of battle and it and the music was so good especially the esper fights like the ha, 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 ha. oh my god like goosebumps i mean this soundtrack in this game just kicks butt from start to finish anyway but i will say when it comes to the hunts uh these rewards are not hype unlike everything else that surrounds them uh the double dipping into dungeons without turbo mode would be absolutely terrible uh, again this is where i don't think bigger is always better but i like the fact that you can do this and i enjoyed strategizing so i liked doing these hunts but i could see why past me did not like this too much and i wouldn't be shocked if many of you out there didn't like them it's not something i would heavily recommend um also the, the way you do the hunts is terrible. It's kind of why I'm like hesitant to go all the way because you have to go to the board, you get your hunt, you go to the person in a completely separate area, then you go on the hunt and then back to them. And so it's this just like all over the map, like you'll pick up the hunt in Rabinaster and then you'll go all the way to, I don't know, uh, Nabina. And then you'll go all the way out to Celica Wood to go all the way back to Nalbi. I'm like, dude, this is so tedious. Like the, the amount of time I spent running around, it, it was that has not that has not improved with age, I will say that. So yeah, the hunts were solid, but it also highlighted again something that's pretty consistent with this game. Thank God for turbo mode, these sprawling environments, like the sand sea. God almighty, the fact that this is on a PS2 disc is insane. And I know not much is happening here, but you got to remember on the PS2, the fact that combat was just happening, you know, you weren't stopping every five seconds. And that's the thing. It's an intent of design, clear as day. Like they saw the game, right? They saw what they were trying to make. They said, let's make a big open world, if you will. Let's, it's obviously going to have a lot of loading screens, but let's make a big open world. And these environments are going to be sprawling. Well, they're going to be big. We can't stop the action. Even they recognize with pacing. We can't stop the action every 10, 15 seconds for turn-based battles. You will never finish this game in a reasonable time. So they made fights happen in the open world. And I kind of like that. No loading screens outside of going into areas. I, again, I kind of learned to like the combat a bit because I understood the intent of the game's design. However, I also wandered into a dungeon known as Necrohall. Oh... My God, the traps, the trolls, the enemies, even with my maxed out characters, I'm like, holy smokes, this is one of the most difficult dungeons I've crawled through. Uh, but it was very rewarding because again, I was uh, in new game plus mode. So I was like, let's go. You want to go? Let's do this. And uh, it was quite rewarding to go in there. So I enjoyed that. Uh, I kind of was confused why they, they did uh, pretty much three party members because there were times you'd have guest party members. And I get it, it ties to this theory that Final Fantasy 12 walked so 13 and its paradigm shifts could run because with the tie to the third party members and the preset strategies of the gambits, which are kind of like your paradigm shifts, except you'd switch them in real time. I saw a lot of Final Fantasy 13 energy here and you saw my opinions on 13 as a trilogy. We have yet to do our lightning returns video, but you saw how I was feeling. So to me, that really resonated i was like okay i'm seeing kotor i'm seeing the the predecessor to final fantasy 13 and what it would become i like this and so yeah the gameplay experience wasn't as tedious as it once was and perhaps that's due to new game plus i'm not sure but again the end result is i really liked final fantasy 12 and so that's it
Easily our longest video on Retro Rebound, and those are my thoughts on Final Fantasy XII after giving it a real fair shake for the first time ever, seeing it from start to finish, seeing a lot of the side content from start to finish, deeply analyzing its mechanics, its themes, its characters, and overall it was a worthwhile journey. So if you got to the end of this video, I mean, first of all, thank you for listening to me rant and rave about a game that I hated for a very long while. This is quite the plot twist, bigger than learning about Noah Gabrent, dare I say. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think about Final Fantasy XII down below. Is it one of your personal favorites? Do you dislike it? And of course, I always like to ask, let me know what game I should play for the first time next. It seems like a lot of you enjoy when I play Final Fantasy, and it's funny because there's a, a lot of lacking in the experience department on that one, but we're getting up there, right? We got six done, nines done. We of course have 13 done, 12's done, 10's done. So that list is starting to shrink. However, we still have a long way to go with a lot of the OG ones. So I'm very, very excited to see your thoughts on this down below. I also tried to be extremely thorough here, even more so. When I looked at some of the feedback for Final Fantasy X's video, a lot of people thought I skipped a beat or two, which is hilarious. It was our longest video on the channel at that time. And here we are going even bigger. So maybe that's just in the spirit of Final Fantasy XII, right? Bigger being better. So I leave it in your hands. I'm looking forward to seeing your thoughts. With that, take great care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.